Hello and welcome everyone to the next event in our webinar series, a presentation by our very own Dr. Jens Kuchenmeister. My name is Garrett Cole, Technology Manager at Thorlabs Crystalline Solutions in Santa Barbara, California. I take great pleasure in moderating today's webinar in which Jens will be providing an introduction to the Thorlabs Quantum Optics Education Kit. Given the rapidly expanding commercial and academic interest in quantum technologies, this is a very timely talk, covering the details of a unique tool set aimed at educational needs and future workforce development. Jens is the leader of Thorlab's Educational Products Business Unit and received his PhD from the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology in Germany, where his doctoral thesis focused on numerical solutions of Maxwell's equations and nanostructured systems. His strong motivation for teaching physics, demonstrated by numerous voluntary teaching assignments, led him to Thorlab's, where he's been growing our educational business unit since 2013. Throughout Jens's talk, please feel free to submit any questions you may have using the Q&A tool, and Jens will be answering these questions following his presentation. Now, at this time, I'd like to hand the talk off to Jens. Thank you for the introduction. Welcome also from my side. What can you expect from today's webinar? I want to show you how to set up and characterize a non-classical light source. Uh, I want to teach you how you can teach quantum optics with our kit. And I want to show you how such a system can be set up so that it's really reliably and student friendly in terms of the alignment. Now, first of all, a few words to our educational kit line. The mindset we have there is that we want to give back to the photonics community. So we want to really excite the next generation of students to go into the field of optics and photonics. And the way that we do that is by writing very detailed manuals. So even people um, that may not be able to purchase the kit can still download the manual. They are free for download and use them in their teaching. And also the kit price is just the sum of the components. So um, I think this is a pretty good uh, package. We also have some design principles that we stick to. First of all, we're trying to stay as open as possible. So we do not like black boxes. That also obviously includes the danger of students misaligning the setup. So we put a lot of effort into making sure that students can reliably align uh, the, the setup in front of them. And I will show you, as I said, how that uh, is done in the quantum optics kit today. We try to use visible light if at all possible. And well, we're choosing the components that are necessary. Um, try to stay away from yeah, too expensive components that are not needed in the teaching context. Now let's dive into the quantum optics uh, topic. We do have a couple of quantum kits, but so far they are analogy experiments, meaning they use a laser or an attenuated laser, laser pulses, just to demonstrate a certain um, topic. For example, we have our bomb tester kit, we have the quantum eraser and the quantum cryptography. This is uh, especially uh, nice because you can really work through all the steps of the BB84 protocol and you can see how an eavesdropper um, that tries to intercept the, the message of Alice and Bob is inevitably uh, revealed. But as I said, this is no real quantum optics, so we're sending laser pulses, and that um, still allows you to, to go through the protocol in the case of the quantum crypto kit, but it's not the same as real quantum optics. And we've been approached um, by a lot of people, and, and we see the need for, for a quantum teaching kit. So without further ado, this is what we ended up with. This is our uh, kit. I will give you just an overview of what you're seeing here, and then we'll go into the details of the physics that's happening. So we start over here with a 405 nanometer laser of about 20 milliwatts of output. We go through two alignment mirrors. There's a half wave plate that we use to set the polarization. Then the light travels here to a nonlinear crystal this is a BBO type one. This is where the magic happens. And once this has pumped the crystal, we don't need the pump laser anymore. So it is collected by a beam trap here at the end. Now, as I said, the photon pairs that are generated um, come from the BBO. They have a certain opening angle and they are collected by two single photon detectors down here. For certain experiments, we need a beam splitter here that guides part of the light down here to this Michelson interferometer, at the output of which there's a third detector. 
For the electronics, we use time tagging. We have an educational time tagger that I will talk about later. Obviously, for, to get a setup like this working, you need a couple of alignment tools. And this is what you can see down here. These are obviously included in the kit. Now let's talk about the physics of this a bit. No, we don't. We talk about the acknowledgement. I'm sorry. <laughs> this is obviously more important than the physics. So we work, work together with um, Kim Weber and Rüdiger Scholz from the University of Hanover. They are two uh, educators that have been working on quantum optics and teaching quantum optics and photon statistics for more than 40 years amongst them. And they were so kind to work with us on the kit. A lot of their ideas really went into the kit, a lot of their design philosophy. So we're really grateful. Um, and so thank you again. But now let's dive into the physics. So the first question is how to build this non-classical light source. And I just told you what we do is we pump a nonlinear crystal. 405 nanometer is the pump. 810 nanometer is the wavelength of the photon pairs. And you can see why, well, the, um, the pairs share the energy and the momentum of the pump. So two times four or five is 810. It's important that these pairs are created. That's different, for example, from uh, nitrogen vacancy centers in diamond, which are often used as uh, non-classical light sources as well. And the, the important is we, thing is we always need to measure those pairs. Now, we use a BBO type 1, which means that we have time energy entanglement, which is just a fancy way of saying we have those pairs. I want to note that we do not generate polarization entangled pairs. So you need a different crystal for that, for example, a type 2 BBO. I can say that we plan on uh, developing an add-on kit where we demonstrate polarization entanglement, but that's still in the works. So now that I've shown you how to create those pairs, how do I measure them? For that, we place two single photon detectors at the output. In our case, we use our SPDMA detectors, which are in a really small footprint, which is good because you can really place the detector into the setup. And we only count events when the detectors T and A click at, um, in, a, in a very small time interval. So assume that the detector T makes a click and a couple of nanoseconds later, detector A makes a click. Then you would say, yeah, probably I detected such a pair. Now, in contrast, when the detector T makes a click and a millisecond later, the detector A makes a click, then most likely those events came from stray light or dark counts of the detector, but it wasn't the pair. So we define a coincidence window. In our case, it's a couple of nanoseconds. And every pair that comes within this window is counted. If two events are further apart in time, they are discarded. Now, how do I know that it's actually non-classical light source that I'm looking at? So I have to verify that experimentally somehow. And this is done by the so-called Granger experiment. So again, the same sketch, but this time I introduce a beam splitter and part of the light that is reflected goes to a third detector B. And now I think it's, it's um, not, not um, difficult to think what happens when a single photon comes to this beam splitter. So we know that the photon cannot be split, right? So it will either transmit or reflect and not both. On the other hand, that means if we do see a lot of events where A and B click at the same time, then that's a strong indicator that this is not a quantum optical light source. So this can be written in this form. This is the so-called autocorrelation function of second order, G2. That's just a fancy way of basically just asking is it a classical light source or not? Because what you're plugging in here are all those count rates. So you're plugging in the coincidence count rates between T and A, T and B, and the triple coincidences. And what you're getting out is one particular number. And that number tells you about the physics of your source. If it's one, then you have a coherent light source, meaning essentially a laser. If it's larger than one, you're dealing with classical light. But if you're smaller than one, you know, okay, that's a case that cannot happen with a 
classical light source. So you have a non-classical light source in front of you. And in our experiment, we reliably get below 0.1. Okay, so now that I've told you about how to characterize a source, then you can really be sure, okay, we are dealing with a non-classical light source, then let's um, start experimenting with it. And the first experiment is just to put a polarizer here in front of detector B and analyze what happens to photons, um, or single photons at a polarizer. And what you see here is a screenshot of our software at the top, the plot that you're seeing is coincidence count rate between detectors T and B over the polarizer angle. So the student will set different polarizer angles and um, record the co coincidence count rate alongside this G2. So it's always important to measure your, your coincidence count signal together with your autocorrelation function because the function down here verifies that what you're seeing at the top is really a, a quantum physical result. And as you can see here, we are below 0.1 for most measurements, only at the very bottom of those curves when the count rate becomes um, rather small, then it's just a statistical um, thing that the G2 goes up. That can be combated by simply using longer integration times. The software that you see here is written in LabVIEW and we are happy to share the code. I expect there's going to be um, a good number of people that want to take our kit as sort of a starting point for their own experiments and that they want to um, expand upon our kit. So um, yeah, you can do that by simply expanding upon the existing LabVIEW code. Next experiment is a single photon Michelson interferometer. So again, we have the similar sketch as before, but instead of placing the detector B at the output of the first beam splitter, we put in an interferometer. So we have another beam splitter and part of the light is guided to one mirror and to a second mirror. One of those is placed on the piezo stage. And what you see then is this here. So we have the same detectors as before. The light is guided towards this, um, um, Michelson interferometer, we use the alignment laser that I will show you later on to align this because I'm not sure if you've asked yourself that, but I showed you that we have photon pairs at 810 nanometers, which you don't see obviously, both because of the wavelength and the intensity. So the question has to be asked, how do students align this? And we have a couple of tricks up our sleeve, um, how this alignment laser helps us, I will show you later on. Now the interferometer itself is just, as I said, a beam splitter, a mirror on a stage and a second mirror. It's placed on a separate breadboard. So students can just take that onto a different uh, desk and either experiment with it beforehand or simply if you're working in pairs of two, one can align the, the two detectors here in the setup and the other group can align the Michelson. So it's basically just gives you an element of, of teaching freedom to, to work with that and um, yeah, experiment with the Michelson beforehand. The measurement, what you're seeing then, is this. So again, we're showing coincidence rate between the trigger detector and B, so the output of the interferometer. And what you're seeing here is this nice curve that you would expect from a Michelson. But when you're looking down here, you see the autocorrelation function that we measure in between, and it's all very good, uh, it's all below the, the classical limit of one. So what you're seeing here is basically the proof that even single photons show interference. And I know that many of you who are, who are listening in, you know about the effect. So it will not surprise you that single photons uh, exhibit interference. But whenever I ask someone, have you seen an actual experiment proving it? 95% of people have to say no. So this is why I think it's um, one of the really great experiments in the kit. The last one is, or so there are several more experiments in there, but sort of the grand finale of, of the uh, experiment uh, in the kit is the quantum eraser. If you're not familiar with what that is, let me take you on a little detour. Suppose you shoot electrons on a double slit, then you know that that shows interference. So this, this yeah, 
thinking of this little particle is, is not sufficient anymore, so you have to picture the electron as a wave. Now, if I'm asking the electron, which of those two slits do you use? That's a question that I do not ask a wave, I'm asking a particle, so to speak. If I measure that, then the interference breaks down. And there's an optical analog to that, and that's the quantum eraser. So we're starting at the same point. We have our Michelson interferometer down here, but now we're introducing polarizers. Perpendicular, if we want to basically ask the photon, which path do you take? So we're placing a zero degree polarizer in one arm, a 90 degree polarizer in the other. And that constitutes a path information. Why is that? Well, you could just at the output, ask your photon, how are you polarized? You could make a measurement. And the answer to that question would be either zero degrees or 90 degrees. And well, that gives you an information because the photon essentially has to decide and this is why, you know, if you have two states, at superpose, if you don't have polarizers in there, you would have two possible states that um, superimpose and form the interference. But if my uh, photon is basically forced to decide for one state, there's nothing left to interfere. So um, the interference will break down in that case. But the great thing is that I can get that interference back. And so this is why it's called quantum eraser. If I'm placing a polarizer with 45 degree orientation at the output, then all photons by definition will um, have a 45 degree orientation at detector B. And I don't know sort of which way they took. Bear with me, I know that this formulation is uh, <laughs> not only slightly problematic, but the point is you have two superimposing states um, that describe your, your photon and that gives you the interference back. Now, how does that look like in the experiment? It's not very different. You still have your Michelson interferometer here. You're placing polarizers in each of the arms and a polarizer at the output. And this is the measurement that um, comes out of it. I'm showing coincidence count rate over stage position. So again, the coincidence between the trigger detector and the detector at the output of the Michelson. And what we're doing is we're moving the stage and recording the, the pattern, just like we did in the single photon Michelson interferometer. The blue curve here, that's the one where the polarizers are parallel. So we just see the standard Michelson interference. Then the student rotates it, one of them by 90 degrees. And then you can see the red curve here, which means there's no more interference visible. And then the student puts the, the third polarizer into the system and 45 degree orientation. And that's the blue green curve down here. So you retrieve the interference information. So that's kind of uh, something that we really enjoy. You know, we had these, this uh, classical um, quantum eraser analogy experiment for years now. And now we finally have one that shows it in the real quantum realm. Now let's move on to to an actually a yeah it's an experiment that that we have in the kit. It is a, a misconception that unfortunately many people have. What about attenuated lasers? Because the the most common misperception when it goes to quantum optics is that you can just visualize light as a barrage of photons, right? There's those little cannonballs flying around, and in that image, it's kind of well, yeah, intuitive to say if I'm just reducing the number of cannonballs, I'm, I'm going to be left with one eventually. And that is a misperception. And this is something that we prove in the kit because it's really important to understand that this is not the case. How do we prove it? Quite simple. You measure the autocorrelation function. And this is this how the setup is um, looking like. So we're starting with a red laser. This is the alignment laser, class two, so you can uh, operate that without laser safety glasses. Then we have a beam splitter here, and at the input of the beam splitter, we have an ND filter to attenuate the light. And at the output of the beam splitter, we have the single photon detectors as before. And what you measure, well, 
it's not <laughs> it's not a real surprise you measure that g2 is one as i said in the beginning and the reason for that is simply um that plot up here so what you what we have when we talk about single photons are quantum physically speaking fox states meaning the probability so this is plotted here for five photons the probability of finding five photons is 100 percent if if i prepare the setup in, in that way and if i have a laser that is attenuated then i'm always going to have the the poissonian distribution of a coherent state here so i will always find that um yeah the photons arrive bunched so they 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 do like to to come together um and there's a certain probability of finding a certain number of photons and that's exactly the difference between um, a classical light source and a non-classical light source and what you're doing when you're attenuating the laser is well you're just sort of scaling that curve here but you're not going to change the statistics of the curve just by scaling it so that is why an attenuated laser is not a single photon source if it were all those quantum optics experiments would have come 20 years earlier but it's really important to show that because it's a common misperception now let's look at some technical details which you know many of you are probably lab course leaders so i think it's, it's worthwhile to have a closer look at some of the elements so let's start with the laser the laser itself you know depending on what kind of quantum optics experiment you look at you can find rather expensive lasers in there single frequency for example or very clean spatial mode and this is something that we don't need for the educational experiment you can actually get away just with a standard $50 diet we did put that in a temperature controlled mount it's not really necessary but if you're thinking of a typical lab course environment you know you're starting in the morning and it's still kind of nice but in the summer in the afternoon the room will be very very warm so we felt like if you want to compare different measurements it's reasonable to have that in a temperature controlled mount and then simply one lens in front of it is there to collimate it and there's an iris to yeah just to clip the beam slightly and that's it nothing more to it so even if the the diet would break at some point which it never has in our development time of a couple of years then um, you can easily buy a new one for just fifty dollars yeah this is the laser driver those two cubes here are for the stage Now let's have a closer look at the detectors. So these are called SPDMA. And the first thing that you may realize about them is we're doing free space coupling. So that has a couple of advantages in our view. First of all, you try, you can, you can stay away from the fiber coupling drama. So if you've ever uh, coupled light into a fiber, it's not always enjoyable to say the least. If you ever wanted to do students to do it, that even less and there's also actually a teaching reason for not coupling it into a fiber because if you're coupling it into a fiber you have a collimator at the point where our detectors stand and then the fiber guides the light to a detector that's somewhere at the edge of your table now in quantum optics we often talk about this importance of the measurement right so we talk about when is the photon measured what's the state in that particular point and this is why we felt like it makes sense to have the detector right in, in the spot where you make the actual detection. And the reason why we can do that is because we have these, these SPDMA detectors, which to the best of my knowledge, have the smallest footprint of single photon detectors that you can find out there. So it's really easy to just put them in your experiment. And now you may ask yourself, what's the nose here? Well, this is what allows us to do the, the free space coupling um what really helps with the free space coupling is that we have a geiger mode apd so the, the the detector which is 500 microns in diameter so it's comparably large and the only thing that we need to do is first block light stray light in in a wavelength range that we're not interested in and secondly have a lens that yeah focuses the light onto the diode 
that lens sits in a zoom housing so we can um, optimize the lens position similarly there's an xy mount so you can fine tune that and finally there's an iris in the front again for stray light reduction okay so this is the uh, electronics now that i want to sp spend a few words on it's an educational time tagger so in the olden days when when the pioneers in the educational field wanted to set up quantum optics experiments they normally borrowed old coincidence electronics from the particle physics um, colleagues. You can now buy this, uh, this kind of analog electronics for a couple of hundred dollars, but it's a lot of tinkering. And we felt like lab course leaders tend to enjoy a more rigid solution, something that's, well, a little less, leads a little uh, less taken care of. And how you do it in, in modern days is time tagging. What does that mean? You have this little box here, which essentially includes a very, very precise clock. And now when a signal comes in from the detector, that signal is given a very, very precise timestamp. And you do that for every signal. And all you need to do then is just compare those timestamps to know if it's in your coincidence interval or not in your coincidence window. And um, Tholabs does not have, have such a device, so uh, we got in touch with Swabian Instruments and they were so kind to provide an educational version of their scientific time tagger. So the scientific one has a, a timing resolution of, I think in the, in, in the order of 10, 10 picoseconds, and there's models below that obviously, um, but for our educational experiments we're very easily um, in the range of, of, of higher jitters than the experiment still works. So um, we decided to have this device with 750 picoseconds of jitter and um, it works nicely. It has four channels. We're only using three of those, but again, we're expecting that people will want to expand on the kit. So uh, Swabian was so kind to have one additional channel here that's active. So you can, yeah, connect a, a either different signal that you want to feed into the experiment or just have a fourth detector. It is only available in the kit. So that's something that um, we discussed with them. So this, this time tagger, they do not buy it, uh, sell it individually. We do not sell it individually. So this is really only part of the kit and, and a way for them to promote the, yeah, <laughs> the educational community. Now, let's talk a little bit about alignment. So this is what I uh, told you that, that I want to make sure that you understand how this is set up reliably. And I want to give you confidence that your students will be able to set this up. Now, let's start with the beam path of the pump laser. So you just place the uh, laser mount here. Beforehand, you um, make sure that the lens is in a position where the output is collimated. Then you have two mirrors. And that's it. Next step, you're putting in the alignment laser. Similarly, with two mirrors, uh, you may say, okay, this one here is in the way of the other. That's correct. So we mounted that on a magnetic platform here. So you can take it in and out of the setup, meaning you can switch between pump and alignment laser. The next design idea is that we have two irises here and here that define the optical axis of the entire experiment. And now we're doing a beam walk both for the pump beam as well as the alignment laser to make sure that both of those lasers pass through the, these two irises and make sure they are on top of each other. There's an insights video from Thor Labs where the, um, this, this method of um, making sure to, to hit those two points is explained. So it's called walking the beam. Essentially, you change the tip and tilt of this mirror to center the laser on this iris. Then you do the same thing with this mirror and this iris, and then you're going back and forth iteratively, and you will eventually end up with the positions that make sure that your laser goes through those two. Now, that's a great trick in general, you know, not, not even not only for, for teaching labs, but for teaching labs in particular,
because if a student, say, bumps into one of those mirrors here, it's very easy to get your alignment back. You just walk the beam and make sure your pump beam goes through. So even if everything on the table is already set, sitting there and is already aligned and the student bumps into the mirror here, you will easily get your alignment back by just walking the beam. Okay, so that's one of the um, tricks. The next one is um, a little bit more difficult because assume that you now place your nonlinear crystal in this position here. So you're taking out this mirror and you say, okay, now I have my pump beam and it hits my BBO crystal and I'm generating my photon pair. But how do you make sure that you hit your detectors? Or in another word, how, where do you place your detectors to make sure that you, you collect a signal? And that's really difficult because as I said, you're not seeing those pairs. And the uh, way that we're doing that, it's I think pretty neat. We put an axicon here and that axicon mimics the photon pair cone. So we have the alignment laser come in, hit the axicon. And if you're not familiar what an axicon does, it's essentially a cone of glass that generates a cone of light. So the input laser is, is translated to a cone of light. And this is how this looks. So if you're placing a, a screen there, you simply have a ring of light. And if I move the, moving the screen closer to my laser, the diameter will get smaller. If I'm moving it further away, the diameter will get larger. And as you may expect, uh, we designed the axicon so that the opening angle of this cone is exactly the same as the opening angle of the photon pairs. So that's a nice, first of all, just a nice teaching visualization. And also at the same time, it's a really great way to align your system. And so you place the detectors um, into this cone and make sure they're positioned correctly. There are one or two um, tricks in there as well, how to make sure that you're getting the rotation angle of the detectors correctly. I try to, to keep this presentation um, interesting and don't go too much into the details so you can read up on that in, in the manual, how we make sure that we have those in the right orientation. There are two more steps in there. So you're going from very broad alignment with the axicon to a, a sort of uh, fine alignment with a fluorescent filter to finally the absolute fine tuning to get your system, uh, your signal with the BBO. And that works very reliable. Now let's get to one more thing that, that I'm often asked when, when talking about this experiment, how does the room have to be, right? So um, what kind of room-like conditions uh, does such an experiment require? First of all, I want to remind you that we're always measuring in coincidence. That helps us actually in terms of stray light because we are only counting events that happen within a certain coincidence window. That means that we're already throwing away a lot of the stray light that we're seeing. That's different to other experiments. For example, if you're working with NV centers in, in diamond, then this is a lot less forgiving in terms of stray light. Still, I, I remind you that the filters that we have in front of the detectors are 810 nanometers plus minus five nanometers. So we need to avoid that wavelength in our surrounding. Obviously that means no light from windows. So if you have direct sunlight in your lab, that's not gonna work um, simply because obviously there's 810 nanometers in, in sunlight. Also, we found that most fluorescent tubes unfortunately have this 810 nanometers in there. There are a couple that do not have it, which is uh, really funny because then you can do um, quantum optics in a completely lit room, but there's ways to get around this. So for example, if you are in a dark room and have your PC monitor switched on, right? So these are LED monitors that normally don't emit in that wavelength. Also, you can illuminate a dark room simply with a green LED, for example, and basically make it as bright as you want to. Now, obviously there are scenarios when, when you can't get away with uh, environmental light that you can't control. We have the same problem when we go to uh, conferences and show the kit. And what we did was we built such an enclosure here. And if you're choosing the correct windows, 
then it's actually kind of a double um, benefit. On the one hand, you have stray light extinction, and on the other hand, laser protection against the blue laser. So um, yeah, for any interested um, people, we can share that information, obviously. And if so, that, that allows you to, to move the entire setup into a classroom, into a lecture hall, and it's still going to work as long as you keep the lid here shut. Now, I could end here on this rather technical note, but I've got one more thing up my sleeve. I want to tell you about uh, an additional experiment that we did that we also described in the manual about optical quantum computing. And it actually comes from a customer. So a while back, someone wrote to us, it's possible to build a low cost two bit quantum computer with an interferometer. And well, at the time we, we didn't really know what to do with that. So this that <laughs> feedback uh, sat with us for a while. And then we found this paper from the group of Oliver Benson about the Deutsch Joscha algorithm with single photons. And that led us to an implementation that I will show you in a second. The Deutsch algorithm, what is that, first of all? It's sort of the easiest quantum computing algorithm that you can think of. So you have a function f, and you do not know this function. It's a binary function, meaning the input and the output values are just 0 and 1. And now you have two possibilities. This function is either constant or not. Now, in a classical computer, you would have to evaluate two values, right? So you need two computations. You evaluate f of 0 and f of 1, and then you know that they are either identical or they're not. And the idea is, or the point is, that with a quantum computer, you only need one measurement to have all the information that you need about the function f. That's the Deutsch algorithm. You can extend that to n dimensions, then it's called Deutsch Yosha. Now, you may think, okay, this is a very strange and simple problem. Is that even relevant? And the answer is actually yes. So when you're looking into the Qiskit documentation, which is uh, IBM's um, well way of accessing their, their uh, quantum computer, then you find under protocols and quantum algorithms, you find the Deutsch Yosha already in second place here. So that tells you two things. Yeah, it's really simple. <laughs> and at the same time, it tells you that um, it's important because otherwise it wouldn't be in there. So the question is, can we implement that? The answer is yes. And what we need to do is we can essentially keep our system the way that it is. We only have to replace those polarizers here from the quantum eraser with um, wave plates. Now, to be very clear, and I need to manage your expectations, and you will have to do the same if you if you do that with students, it's not like we're building a quantum computer that can calculate anything, right? It's not like this is going to give me the answer of A plus 5 or factorize 21. The whole purpose of this is the teaching purpose is to really give an educator the option to discuss quantum computing on a live experiment. So really talk about what are qubits in the context of optical quantum computing? Because in other material platforms, for example, um, this, this um, superconducting uh, quantum computing or trapped ions, I think there's a more intuitive understanding of what, what the bits is. In quantum computing, and when you're doing it optically, that is normally not the case. And I hope I'm not spoiling anything when I'm saying the, the polarization is one of the bits and the second um, bit is the way through the interferometer. So if you're seeing optical quantum computing, you will always see some kind of interferometric setups. And this is exactly why it's interesting in this context. So it gives you the opportunity to talk about that in a teaching context and actually try it out, even if it's just a very, very simple um, quantum algorithm. And that brings you to the way that these quantum algorithms work. So you're writing down a quantum circuit and it's going to be quite quite long if I'm going into all detail here, so I'm not going to do that. You're just seeing here those different things. Those are Hadamard gates, and then there's some kind of operation and some kind of measurement. What I'm trying to, to visualize here is that you can translate that to the optical domain. So you have an interferometer here, so we 
have a half wave plate that is used to set a certain polarization that corresponds to this input Hadamard gate. Then we have a beam splitter, which corresponds to the other. You have this operation, which is essentially done by the half wave plates that are in these two um, interferometer arms. You recombine to do the measurement with the output um, APD here, so the single photon detector at the output. And so this is a direct one-to-one -one translation. And now you realize that in our kit, I talked about a Michelson interferometer. This down here is a Mach 10 interferometer. So we have to, again, take another step in our mind, but it's obviously not very difficult to go from a Mach Zender to a Michelson. So again, you have this correspondence of those different elements to the experimental setup down here. So you have the half wave plate that sets the input. You have the wave plates in here. They're not half wave plates anymore. They're quarter wave plates because the light passes through them twice in a micro interferometer. And then you need some additional controllers, obviously, to um, control those. And voila, there you go with a optical quantum computer. Now, these things here, so you, you're putting them into the Michelson. What you have is, why did we choose them as um, liquid crystal wave plates and not just wave plates that you rotate? It's basically just phase stability. So if you're switching between the different states, um, it's just more reliable. And the end result that you see here is the plot at the bottom. So again, you have the coincidence count rate, and then you're switching between those polarization states by changing the voltages of those liquid crystal wave plates. And then you can see all those four different functions that um, you see in the Deutsch algorithm. Again, I know that you don't, if you're not familiar with the Deutsch algorithm, you won't immediately see why there's four possibilities. That's fine, you can read up all that in our uh, manual. So we put all of this into the additional experiments section of the manual. But this is what, what your students are gonna see. So you basically have those logic high or lows, right? Corresponding to coincidence count rate is up or it's, it's down. The parts, they're not included in the quantum optics kit, but it's uh, not a lot. So if you, um, yeah, compare it to the kit price. <laughs> um, so you only have to uh, purchase those wave plates together with the controllers, and then you can do corner computing in your lab. So now I hope that that uh, was a nice little um, ending to the presentation that I uh, wanted to give you. So this is the kit. It's the result of a couple of years of development time with our collaborator. It's um, been tested by several groups, and I'm uh, always looking forward to, to talking to more of you. So we we really enjoy working with collaborators. So if you have ideas, if either if you have a just an idea or you already have a finished setup, just get in touch and we'll talk about um, if we can turn that into an educational kit. Also, we're always looking for feedback and extensions of our kits. So if you do something with our kit, you know, obviously there are a lot of quantum experiments that you can log into. Um, not only for this kit, but also if you have feedback for our other kits, just get in touch with me with this uh, email address and I'm very happy to talk to you. Thank you very much. I'm very, um, I'm looking forward to your questions that you may have. All right, I hope everyone can hear me and I wanna thank Jens for that excellent and informative presentation. Uh, we have a few questions in the Q and A, but I'd again like to invite the audience members to continue submitting those uh, while we run through the Q and A portion. Uh, but for now, I'll start jumping right into the into the questions. So, audio working okay, Jens? Can you hear me? I I can hear you, and I hope you hear me as well. <laughs> yes, sounds perfect. So yeah, I, one of the first questions I'm going to ask, I'm going to throw one in that's not in the Q and A right now, and just uh, inquire about the cost of the kit, and if you can give some background on the cost drivers for the overall system. Yeah, that makes sense. So the kit in itself um, is, um, together with the breadboard, is about uh, 31,000 euros or um, 34,000 uh, US dollars. Um, again, it's just the sum of the components. Um, certainly one of the cost drivers is the single photon detectors, um, which is about 4,500 each. Um, yeah, and as I said, so the quantum computing addition is like another 4K. But again, I think, you know, in terms of value for money, that's a pretty good package. Yeah, I agree. So, 
Um, one question that came up in the Q and A was uh, if there was an option for type two BBO crystal, what would be the additional cost for that? And while you're answering that, if you can give some background on the difference between a type one and uh, type two crystal, that would be uh, informative. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, so first of all, what what the type one does, it gives you one photon cone. A type two gives you two cones, and they're sort of like this. And you have to put yourself with your detectors at the intersection of those two cones. And judging from from the um, experiences that we have with a collaborator, the type two crystal is comparably mean to a line. So when we are looking into the um, add-on kit about polarization entanglement, we will most likely use a crossed type one crystal. What's that? Essentially, you take two type one BBOs, you rotate one and put them together. And now when you are pumping with a 45 degree orientation of your pump, you will generate pairs in the first one. You will also generate pairs in the second one. So you have two cones in each other. And when you're aligning the angle correctly, they will overlap as well. And so then you can find your entangled pairs. What you need to do in order for that to work is you need to place a, so first of all, obviously you need you need a, a different crystal and then you will need a compensation plate because um, those crystals exhibit birefringence. And, and when you're coming in at 45 degree orientation, you will see a, a walk off and you need to compensate for that. So they asked about the cost. In the very ideal case, we only need this new crystal and this compensation crystal. We also already have the half wave plate that we need to set the input polarization. So those two crystals would translate to about one and a half K, but that only um, works when the alignment procedure can stay as it is. And judging from experience and, and um, educators that I've talked to that have done this experiment, the type two crossed crystal is quite a bit more challenging than the just standard type one. So I cannot rule out that we will have to have some sort of additional alignment mechanism because as I've pointed out before, I'm only happy to release a kit where I'm sure that students can really systematically align it. And so basically what I have to say is that the add-on kit is gonna be either one and a half thousand or in the couple of thousands, it's, it's not gonna be 10K. So that's, that's far off. Oh, that's very interesting. That's very cool. Um, all right, I'm going to start going through some of the Q&A questions uh, from the beginning. Uh, one from uh, Jeff Baldwin was, uh, will the user be able to set the coincidence time um, in the experiment? Or I guess yeah. the coincidence window? Yeah. Exactly. So that, that's a parameter that you can set in the software. Um, in our The standard default setting is five nanoseconds. Yeah, thank you, Jens. Uh, and continuing, um, what is the time resolution achievable in the G2 measurement? Yeah, okay, so that depends on basically, you have to look at what, what limits that essentially, it's the detectors and the electronics. The detectors have a um, output pulse width of about 50 nanoseconds, and they obviously have a dead time. In our case, it's 35 nanoseconds, so that basically translates to 20 megahertz of maximum count rate. The um, tagger has the 750 picosecond jitter. So those two basically define the timing resolution. So we're not going to get better than that. All right. Yeah, no, thank you very much. Um, sorry, scroll on through these to see. Uh, do you have any information on the uh, conversion efficiency in the nonlinear crystal? Um, so for, uh, go ahead. Yeah, that's, that's actually, you, you know, you can buy different crystals. For example, there's also um, some um, crystal called periodically polled KTP, which a lot of people use, um, that has better conversion than this BBO. The downside is that people often um, have to heat that to a certain temperature. It's, it's impressive how little energy is actually <laughs> converted. So um, we're going in, as I said, the output of the laser is about 20 milliwatts. Then we're cutting a bit with those irises here and we arrive with about 10 to 15 at the crystal. And that translates to only about 
individual count rate of about 300 kilohertz of the, det at the detector. And so going from 10 milliwatts, if you equate how many photons that are, that's a lot, <laughs> and you're only arriving at a detection rate of 300 kilohertz, and you can do the math and it comes down to, I think it's like literally 10 to the minus 15, 16, 17, or 18 in that range. So it's really, really small. Yeah, understood. Um, all right, continuing on, yeah, this interesting technical question. Uh, since the detectors are you know, open and free space, is there any concern with, say, stray light, or say if you accidentally misaligned and shot a laser into the detectors, are there any concerns about damaging the detectors or saturating or causing other issues in the detectors? That's that's a super important question, um, especially in the context of a teaching lab, because you're always going to have that one person either switching on the lights or, or <laughs> taking off the detector nose. Um, clear answer, you will not damage the detector by any kind of light shining onto it, not even a laser. It simply goes into saturation. So that was um, actually the first prerequisite I, I told our engineers when they developed this, it must not break. Yeah, yeah. And clearly, once you reach saturation, but you dim the lights, the system recovers. That's not like a permanent change in the detection. No, 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 exactly. Yeah, another uh, just uh, detailed question about the system. Uh, will the user interface uh, be compatible with Windows 11? It, it should be. So I, I wouldn't know why not, because we're, we're implementing it in, in the standard um, LabVIEW frame with, with the newest LabVIEW version. So um, I, I would have to ask my engineers if we've tested it. I, I'm very confident that we did. Yeah, very nice. I'm going to go slightly out of order in the questions. Um, and one was a, a user, or a, no, a viewer had asked about one buying, say, detectors or counting electronics separately. And then I'm going to expand on that. So let's say you know, someone's been a um, purchaser of Thor Labs components in the past and maybe have parts of the system already in the lab, um, how, how would that work? Are there ways to, to you know, customize in that case? Yeah, so that's what I'm saying basically goes for all educational kits. We're very happy to make specials. So if um, someone already say, for example, like you have the laser mount already or any of the drivers or whatever component in here, we're happy to just make you a special. You can easily calculate the price yourself. You just subtract the price of the individual component from um, the kit price. There's one um, exception to that statement, and that's the time tagger, as I said before. Yeah. Um, but other than that, you can just put it all together depending on what kind of components you already have. Yeah, and I just want to jump on that one point because I think it's really interesting. So just to remind the, the viewers or the folks still sticking around, so that was a uh, sort of custom system specifically for the EDU kit, right? This uh, time tagger uh, that's employed in the system. So, yeah, exactly. It's because it's... Sorry for interrupting you. Yeah, it's, it's really just no, a, matter of, yeah, yeah, yeah. A, yeah. a matter of money because if you're buying this in, in the scientific version, um, it gives you, it's like a five figure price. And, and that's obviously not suitable for an educational one. And at the same time, we felt like time tagging is what you find in most quantum optics labs today. So we felt like it does have an educational value to use modern technology in the kit. No, again, that, I think that's a really neat partnership between Schwabian and uh, Thor Labs for that. Um, let's see, going through the questions. I think this was addressed earlier, but I'll still uh, just reiterate it. Uh, can you remind everyone on the, the power of the pump laser? Uh, so the 405 nanometer uh, laser? Yeah, it's 20 milliwatts. So this is why we have um, in the kit, we, we supply it with one set of laser safety goggles so you already know which one to use. And if you have a larger group of students working on it, you can just simply take the, the same unit and buy more of them. Yeah, okay, very nice. And uh, I'll kind of put you on the spot um, because I kind of know the answer to this, but not for sure. But um, does Thor Labs separately sell BBO crystals? Is this something you could buy like uh, separate from the kit? Are you aware? Yeah, you can. So we we do have a number. We have a line of BBO crystals um, neatly mounted. Um, the particular one that we have in the kit is not yet on the web page. I think it will eventually uh, be be available there. But if you want to just, for example, buy the the crystal that we have in the kit, just um, 
email tech support and they will give you the part number and a quote. All right, yeah, very nice. Um, I am going to jump down. <laughs> There's a lot of questions. This is really nice. We're getting good uh, audience engagement. Which I'm not surprised because it was a fantastic presentation. Um, yeah, so uh, this has been covered a bit, but I'll let you reiterate or recover it. You know, what is necessary or is it possible to show entanglement between photons in, in such a setup? Repeat that? Sorry. Uh, yeah, is there a possibility in the setup or with a modified version of the setup to show entanglement between the, the photons? Yeah, so I think, first of all, it's worth, again, pointing out that what we are seeing here, so those pairs, this is already one, one form of entanglement. So the fact that you're seeing those pairs, they are already entangled. Um, it's just called time energy entanglement. And the, the, I, <laughs> I can tell you about one experiment that we have in the kit that supports that statement. So if you have that, this scenario here, so you pump the laser and you generate your photon pairs, then again, a typical misperception of this is that you are now generating sort of two, two individual single photon sources. Mm -hmm. That's not true, actually. So if you are covering up one of those, or you're simply not detecting it, and then you measure only the lower arm and you characterize that, so you're measuring the G2, you will see that this is still classical. And I know that's kind of counterintuitive because you feel like, shouldn't, shouldn't that show non-classical statistics as well? And the answer is no. So you really need to have those two, which is why this sort of source is also called a heralded single photon source. So you always need the herald. So this is already one form of entanglement. But as I said, polarization entanglement is something that you need a different crystal for. But I feel like, you know, when you're thinking about how to set up a curriculum, I feel like it's important that students understand all of the things that are in the kit first. So they, I think they should understand what is a single photon? How do you characterize a non-classical light source and experiment with it before sort of going to, to the top shelf of polarization entanglement, which is of course exciting because you can look at Bell's inequality. But I think reaching that level requires you to really understand everything prior to that. And so, which is why I feel like this is a good starting point and the add-on kit will sort of finalize it. Yeah, no, thank you very much for that, uh, that very in-depth explanation there. Um, unfortunately, I need to, to run, but I'd like to thank everyone uh, for attending the talk, for again, being very active and contributing uh, follow-up questions. And I'd like to thank you again, Jens, for that very nice presentation, very good overview of this exciting uh, new EDU kit. So I'll clap here from, <laughs> from Santa Barbara. Um, yeah, so again, I'd like to thank everyone for the attendance. I will note there were some extra questions that we can address afterwards. Um, so uh, direct responses uh, to those. And uh, yeah, please keep an eye out for future Thor Labs uh, webinars. Be sure to attend. And thank you very much for your attendance, and we hope to see you again in the future.